About a month ago, I switched from a Huawei Mate 20 Pro to the Samsung Galaxy S20 Plus, and I just wanted to share my thoughts with you about how I've found using the phone so far. Can you hear the seagulls? They're tired of lockdown. So the Galaxy S series has always been Samsung's statement series of phones. It's the phone that people go to if they're not going to uh, buy an iPhone this year and they're going over to Android. It's the phone that's known to be the iPhone competitor and so what they generally do is stick all of their safe working technology into their S series phones. Now I think the Ultra is a bit of a step in another direction in terms of how experimental it is. Um, but in terms of the S20 and the S20 Plus, they've really stuck to just putting a high-end specs in there, but tried and tested formulas. Specs-wise, it's pretty much got everything you can expect to see in 2020, as you can see here. Notable specs are obviously the Snapdragon 865 chip if you're in the US. Um, unfortunately, if you're in Europe, you get the Exynos chip, which I'll get onto a little bit later, but it does have some disadvantages. Um, you've also got 12 gigabytes of RAM in all models um, and it also comes in 128 gigabytes as the lowest amount of storage and 512 gigabytes uh, as the highest amount of storage. Interestingly, no one asked me how much storage I wanted in a shop, so I'm assuming 128 gigabytes is the most popular. Up front we have this lush 1440p AMOLED display and it supports HDR10 plus and 120 hertz. Unfortunately, if you want to use 120 hertz, you are limited to HD, um, but if you want to go up to quad HD, then you're limited to 60 hertz. Um, I don't see this as a big problem, as um, on a screen this size, the difference between HD and quad HD is really minimal, whereas the difference between 60 hertz and 120 hertz is a little bit more noticeable. The edge screen has been lost, which is a shame because I kind of love that effect but it still remains a little bit with the screen curving around the sides, just a tiny bit, but not enough that you get those sort of accidental button presses that most people are complaining about. So is 120 hertz really worth it? Well, I can tell you that the UI seems satisfyingly snappy when I've got the 120 hertz on. It is smooth as anything, um, but actually when I've asked my partner, who's now got a Samsung Galaxy S20, um, she said she changed to 120 hertz and don't notice the difference at all. So personally, for the average consumer, I'd say that 120 hertz refresh rate is not something that you should be looking for that you need in a phone, but that's not to say that high refresh rate displays aren't gonna be a thing of the future, and eventually they'll probably be in most phones. The bottom line is Samsung does the best displays still, and they really are a joy to look at. Um, the only thing we did find with it is that the brightness setting um, sometimes comes out too dark, so if you set to auto brightness, you'll end up turning your brightness up quite a lot. A random thing, maybe a firmware fault or something like that, um, but hopefully we get a fix to that soon. There's obviously also a fingerprint sensor built into the display. Coming from the um, Huawei Mate 20 Pro, it's nice not to have to push your finger down hard um, on the display just to open it, and it works pretty well. Um, the only thing is for me that you're limited to um, four fingerprints, I think it is, and for me, I like to register my two thumbs and my two index fingers um, a few times just so you get a more accurate read on it. Unfortunately, you can't do that with this as you're limited to four fingerprints. The rest of the body is pretty simple with just the lock button and the volume rockers on the right hand side, speakers on the bottom and a USB socket. No headphone jack here, unfortunately. So on the back, we have the camera bump and you might think that the camera bump takes up most of the back of the phone just by some of the press pictures. But actually on the S20 Plus, the camera bump is relatively small compared to the rest of the phone. It does protrude about a millimeter or two, so it does mean it's not gonna fit, um, sit flush on a flat surface. But if you get a case for this, which you really should be doing with a phone this size, um, then that will solve that problem. So on the camera bump, we have the 12 megapixel main camera, which is f1.8 to let in lots of light. Then we have the ultra wide camera, which is 12 megapixels also, but is f2.2. Then we have the 64 megapixel uh, telephoto camera, which is three times optical zoom, and that is f2. A bit of a strange decision, but we'll get into that later. On the plus model, you also get a time of flight sensor for depth sensing. I'm impressed with how this camera performs, especially in good light. Samsung seems to make things a bit more vibrant, but I always enjoyed that on the Huawei phones, so it's quite nice to have some color pop here too. Photos were sharp with all cameras and they handled dynamic range pretty well. There's plenty of comparisons out there with other cameras, but looking at the photo results from this camera, it fares pretty well. 
The portrait mode or live focus seems to work really well and in this situation you can almost get up close and get some really nice natural bokeh. Where this software shines though is on the 10 megapixel front camera where you can add some background blur to your selfies and adjust it after the fact if you think it was too much. The selfie camera also allows you to zoom out a bit if you're trying to get a bit of extra reach, which is nice, but I think I prefer it to be automatically wide with the option to zoom in where necessary. Selfies are always better as wider in my opinion. In terms of video, you get your standard 4K at 60 frames a second um, with stabilization, which is great, it has to be said. Um, but Samsung has added one new feature into this phone, um, which has definitely been a talking point, and that is 8K video. Now, I've seen a lot of YouTubers urge people not to use the 8K video, as they don't think it's worth it. I disagree. Unlike the S20 Ultra, on the Plus you can only use the 8K mode on the telephoto camera, as the main 12 megapixel camera doesn't have enough pixels to accommodate for 8K, whereas 64 megapixel telephoto does. It's a confusing move in my opinion, but I think the 12 megapixel seems to be the sweet spot for good phone cameras at the moment, and as you start going up in numbers, it becomes harder to manage low light noise, especially in sensors this small. So maybe they didn't want to risk the quality of the main camera just for 8K, but then why didn't they put the 64 megapixels into the ultra wide? It would have made a lot more sense to have more detail um, in the ultra wide, but I guess that's a conversation for another video. But again, the 8K video is actually where I disagree with a lot of other YouTubers. If you take a look at this 4K video from the main camera, it's decent and well stabilized, but it's clearly over sharpened, which is always a problem with phone cameras. Now take a look at the 8K. I think it looks so much cleaner and less sharpened, infinitely more watchable than the 4K footage. I did have an issue with some stuttering during recording, which is very annoying and hopefully will be fixed in firmware, but in terms of the actual image quality, the 8K video feels better, at least in well lit situations to me. There's also a single take mode which takes a different combination of photos and videos for those moments where you can't decide whether you want to take a photo or a video. I haven't actually used this yet um, in a normal environment, but time will tell whether this is actually handy or it's just another gimmick. Now cameras seem to be the most differentiating factor in 2020 phones, but what is the phone actually like to use? While well, the Samsung Galaxy S20 runs Samsung's One UI skin over Android, and while people coming from a Google Pixel or maybe a OnePlus phone might find it a little bit overcrowded and hard to get used to, I think it's a perfect combination of features while not throwing those features in your face. And I think Samsung does this really well, um, including minimal bloatware and still allowing you to find advanced features if you need it, but if you don't, you can use the phone pretty simply. The phone has always been lightning fast and I never really faced any stuttering, even with the Exynos chip performing well. I also haven't noticed it get really hot, but my partner's S20 got particularly warm during initial setup. There's a 4,500 mAh battery, which is expected for a 2020 phone, and especially one with a screen this big and bright, but how did it actually translate to real world use? Now the answer is, okay. Now the first thing I did when I got this phone is put it into 120 hertz, and so most of this information is gonna be with the phone at 120 hertz. Um, but coming from my Huawei Mate 20 Pro, the battery on the Samsung definitely seems to fall faster. Now the screen is bigger. Um, it could be argued that I use it at higher brightness most of the time because it's a lush screen. Um, but it generally falls a lot quicker and I end the day um, with a lower percentage with the Samsung S20 Plus than I did with the Mate 20 Pro. Now this could be to do with Huawei's aggressive power management. They're known for sort of force closing apps and stopping things um, so that your phone can last longer. Um, whereas Samsung obviously employs a different method which perhaps isn't as aggressive. Now all this information is with the Exynos chip which is the European version of the Samsung phone. Um, I've heard with the Samsung Galaxy S20 in America with the Snapdragon chip it actually performs better and uh, the battery life is slightly longer. I haven't done any tests myself but just look it up on YouTube and you'll see a few things about that. The S20 Plus also supports 5G and although 5G is good for the future proofing, um, I don't think for the average consumer they should be thinking too much about whether a phone's got 5G or not. Uh, maybe in a year or two's time where most cities are covered by some sort of 5G um, coverage. Um, other than that, I think it's kind of a nice extra to have, but not essential if you're looking for a phone. So should you buy the Samsung Galaxy S20 Plus in 2020? Well, when you're looking for a new phone, you know Samsung Galaxy S series is going to have the top specs, um, and you know it's going to be a safe option and this is no different. 
It really does have top notch specs and I think 99% of people will be happy with the S20 or the S20 Plus. The problem is, is that in 2020, a lot of manufacturers are coming up with cheaper flagships, but only sacrificing a couple of features that people might not need and making an overall cheaper package. So I think with the S20 series, the actual original S20 is probably better value for money in 2020. And if you're one of those people who has to live on the cutting edge of technology, a phone enthusiast, and you don't mind a few firmware updates to get things perfect, then the S20 Ultra definitely offers something different. Um, but I don't think that's really for the masses yet. That's it from me. Let me know what you thought of this video down below in the comments. It's a little bit different to what I normally do, but I'm trying to get myself out there and try new things during this lockdown. I think it's a perfect time to experiment with things that you wouldn't necessarily have done before or things that you've always wanted to do. Leave a comment down below with your opinion on the Galaxy S20 series of phones. Do you have it? Are you thinking of getting it and why? Um, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more videos like this, um, feel free to subscribe and if this video goes particularly well then I might even do some more mobile content. I hope you're all staying safe, staying inside and protecting your healthcare system. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.